Hi everyone, my name is Matt Keeter. I'm an independent graphics researcher, and I'm going to present my work on massively parallel rendering of complex closed form implicit surfaces. When I say implicit surfaces here, I'm talking about functions which you can evaluate at some point somewhere in space at an XYZ position that return a single value. And so we say that if that value is negative, we're inside the shape. If it's positive, we're outside. Otherwise, we're on the surface of the shape. So we have an isosurface where the function is zero. When we say closed form implicit surfaces here, I'm talking about these functions where you can represent them by a series of math operations. So addition, subtraction, transcendental functions, min, max, and so on. Uh, on the right, we have an example where we have a ring where everything that's red is negative, so it's inside. Everything that's blue is positive, so it's outside. So this is the actual shape that we care about. And in this function, you should notice that we're doing CSG, constructive solid geometry, with a max operation. That'll be important later. When we say complex closed form implicit surfaces, we just mean big functions. So this thing in the background here has about a thousand clauses. And if you render it in 3D space, you get this lovely architectural scene. So you should really think of this as an assembly language for shapes. It's a very low level representation that you would compile down to from higher level tools. And it's got a lot of cool properties. You've probably seen these in the demo scene. So Shader Toy, uh, there are CAD companies doing computer aided design with this as a backend. It's a very lightweight kernel for user generated content. So it's very neat, but it's also very hard to render. One strategy, and there's a bunch of literature on different ways of meshing these surfaces. So you generate triangles and then you render those conventionally, but it's hard to get that right. So you'll have non-manifold shapes, self-intersections, uh, getting edges and corners to be sharp is always a challenge. There's also a bunch of literature on ray tracing, uh, but that often constrains the, con constrains the shapes where you'll need C1 continuity or Lipschitz continuity. Otherwise your sphere tracing will just zoom by the shape and just miss the surface. And so you can't really go as wild with the equations as you might want. Our strategy is building on two different ideas. Uh, so we're using a paper from 92 by Duff that talks about using recursion and subdivision to evaluate and interval arithmetic to do this evaluation. And then more modern work using uh, massively parallel vector graphics and that line of research. So using pertile command lists on the GPU. So it's much more flexible in terms of what kind of models you can put in. And it's also philosophically satisfying. This is a very high level overview of the algorithm, which we're gonna revisit a couple times. For now, just notice that we're evaluating big regions of space, we're marking some as empty and filled, and then we're subdividing. That's all you need to know so far. And we're gonna have three major building blocks that we build on. The first one is running an interpreter on the GPU. So if you think back to this ring equation here, where we've got, excuse me, we've got this equation. One option is we could take this and paste it into a GLSL shader or a CUDA kernel, compile it and run that kernel on every pixel. And that would be very fast, but relatively inflexible. And so we take a separate strategy of actually building an interpreter that runs on the GPU. So it's not gonna be as fast, but it's gonna be interpreting an intermediate representation of the shape, uh, which means that you can actually specialize the shapes at runtime instead of a kernel, which is only compiled once. The way we do this is we build what we call an instruction tape from an equation. Uh, so you can imagine that the interpreter is basically a for loop, which iterates over each of these lines. It takes the opcode and it evaluates it reading arguments and writing to an output slot. Slots are the VM equivalent of registers. I'm just using the word to avoid confusion. Uh, so some things take immediates, some things take slots, but if you run through this, you'll end up with an output value, which is your shape at the given X and Y position. And so we can look at how efficient this is by taking this equation here, uh, which is built from about 6,000 clauses and produces a monologue from the Tempest and rendering it with the brute force kernel we talked about earlier. So just every pixel, compile a kernel with this equation, and then compare that against running the interpreter on every single pixel and seeing how this scales. And so both the brute force and the interpreter are roughly linear with the number of pixels. And the brute force in orange has a smaller slope because it's more efficient. And so we see about a 19x overhead if we compare the two slopes. The motivation here, by the way, is looking at the green line is our full algorithm, which is basically flat all the way up to 4,000 pixels squared. So this is good incentive to keep following along. The tape here, uh, we don't really explain where it comes from previously, but I can tell you that it comes from an intermediate representation, which is a directed acyclic graph. And here we start to borrow from the compiler literature. So using a DAG lets us have a common sub-expression elimination where square root here is only used once, even though it shows up twice in the equation. We take this DAG, uh, run a topological sort, which is a way of walking through it in order. So you'll notice this is the same order as the instruction tape here as you go through it and then do uh, the equivalent of register allocation, again, from compiler design, where the DAG is in single static assignment form. We then go through and I implemented a very greedy algorithm, so very simple, where it assigns slots relatively naively. 
Uh, but in the paper, I cite a couple of other works that go into this in more detail for optimization. The DAG, uh, you might ask where that comes from as well. And the answer is this is now beyond the scope of the paper, where I built a library called lib5 previously, which is specifically for manipulating these kinds of equations. So if you use this, you get a standard library of shapes and you get the DAG generation for free. So that's the first building block. The second building block is interval arithmetic. And so you might be familiar, but it's basically a way of doing math on regions instead of on individual points. So if you look at this region, you can see it has x from minus 1 to minus 0.5, y from about 0.7 to 1.2. And we can do the same tape, evaluate the same tape, but tracking the bounds of the computation instead. So if you're squaring minus 1 to minus 0.5, the output is somewhere between 0.25 and 1. Uh, so we go through and the interpreter has uh, implementations for each of these opcodes using interval arithmetic and it gives you out an interval bound. And the cool thing about this is that if your input point is anywhere within that input region, the output is guaranteed to be within this range. And you can see that in this case it's actually tight. It's minus 0.14 to 0.56, which if you look at the colors is basically the same here. Uh, this is not necessarily always true, but it's conservative. So the interval is guaranteed to contain anything in the input region. And once we have this interval, we can do something very cool, which is we look at the upper bound of the interval. And if that is negative, then every single point within that region is negative, which means that we are inside the shape for that entire region. So we've done one interval evaluation and we've proved a whole chunk of the shape to be inside. Similarly, you can also prove chunks of the shape to be outside if the lower bound is positive. Otherwise, either that region contains the boundary or it's just being conservative and you're not quite sure. And so now this image that I showed before maybe makes a little more sense, where the big region here is proved to be inside the shape at the first pass. These uh, orange and blue regions are inside the shape at the second pass. And then we do per pixel evaluation on the remaining ambiguous regions, which contain the boundary. That's the second building block. The third building block is what we call tape shortening. And this is the trick which actually makes our algorithm work. So if you look at this shape, you remember that there's a circle of radius 1 and then a negative circle of radius 1 half that's being cut out of it. That's the two components in max here. But our interval here, this region, only actually cares about the outer circle. And the cool part is you can see that in the equation. So here, the left-hand side, these intervals, these conservative bounds, the left-hand side is always bigger than the right-hand side because its lower bound is above the right-hand side's upper bound. And what this means on an intuitive level is we can take this max operation and within that square in space, replace it with just a copy from slot zero to slot one. Once we do that, we notice that the previous operation writes to slot one, but that value is never used. So we can skip that, shorten the tape. So we've removed one clause from the tape. And so this is kind of a high level intuitive motivation of what's going on here. Uh, and we have a more formal definition in the paper. We have algorithms and everything. But the idea is that you look at these min max clauses and you can do essentially mark and sweep garbage collection uh, in order to prove entire regions inside or outside the shape. You might wonder how well this works. And the answer is it works amazingly if your model has a lot of CSG. So this uh, shape had originally 6,000 clauses. Once you go to 64 by 64 tiles, each individual tile has an average of 350 clauses left active in it. Once you go to eight by eight tiles, they have an average of 28 clauses left active. So this is a 200 something improvement. And you can see here why the uh, overhead of the interpreter is dwarfed by optimi algorithmic optimizations. All right, so we've presented all of our three building blocks, which means we can now put them together into a full algorithm, uh, which looks something like this. So we take the shape, we encode and allocate slots. We know how that works now. We send the instruction tape to the GPU, and then we do cycles of interval evaluation followed by tape shortening on pixel regions, and then we do pixel evaluation as a final pass. And if you're paying attention, this is exactly the same image that I've been showing all along, where we do these first and second passes with intervals. Uh, we subdivide by 8x on each axis, so 64x total, uh, and that's important. I'll get to that later. And then we do per pixel evaluation here. And so this gives you your final image. On the GPU, you have to care a lot about how things are stored in memory and in terms of how threads are accessing them. Uh, and so at the largest level, the 64 by 64 tiles, we're densely packing them in both space down here and GPU RAM here. Uh, and they contain their positions in XY, and then a index to both a specialized tape for this region and an index, and a, sorry, a pointer to the next level down. And what I mean by that is that once we've found the interesting regions, so say these light blue ones are ambiguous and have to be processed further, we're gonna subdivide them, uh, but they're gonna be sparsely distributed in space. So we tightly pack them in RAM and end up with this tree structure where in each case, the second level is also a flat array in RAM, so it can be addressed efficiently. Uh, we do 64x subdivision, and the reason we do that is because if you think about this one tile, it gets divided into 64 subtiles, 
And then those 64 subtitles are evaluated by two warps exactly. The cool thing about that is that all of those threads and those warps, all of those subtitles are using the tape from their parent tile here. And so doing an even multiple of 32 means that you don't have any divergence between threads and the interpreter. You don't have one thread doing addition and one thread doing subtraction. That would lead to thread divergence, which would be less efficient. So keeping things with a factor of 64 lets the threads all stay together. We benchmark this on three machines, uh, my aging MacBook Pro, a relatively recent workstation, and the biggest GPU I could get my hands on on AWS. And we benchmarked in 2D with two models. So we have the text benchmark, which is very much a best case scenario, lots of CSG, and then a 2D gears model, which is fewer clauses, but has mathematically perfect involute curves if you look around, along the edges. Uh, and the text model does great. On the biggest GPU, it's effectively flat with image size, which means that we're pretty far from saturating the GPU. And this is at, uh, what, 100 plus frames per second at 4096 pixels squared. For the gears, it's even faster, actually, probably because there's fewer clauses. But this is 30 frames per second on my old laptop and uh, hundreds of frames per second on the big GPU, even at the biggest image size. And so one very cool metric we can look at is the amount of work that's being done per pixel where if we normalize so that walking through the tape fully, evaluating every clause is a score of one, then we amortize interval evaluation across every pixel within that interval, we end up with something like this, where you end up walking the tape much less than once per pixel, because both uh, we have amortization over intervals, and then we also have the tapes getting shorter and shorter as you recurse down the tree. So this is showing that we're walking the tape less than a thousandth on average per pixel, and this is what makes the algorithm work. The gears are a little bit less efficient, uh, but similarly, there's a significant factor compared to brute force, which would walk the tape once per pixel in the image. We also do this in 3D. And so in 3D, the algorithm is broadly the same, although we do three rounds of interval evaluation and tape shortening with 64 cubed, 16 cubed, and 4 cubed. So we're now dealing with voxels and regions rather than 2D intervals. Uh, and then at the end, we do both voxel evaluation and normal evaluation, which I'll talk about shortly. We're rendering the height map, which is some 3D, uh, 3D volume that we care about. And much like in 2D, we divide this into tiles, we evaluate them, we pick out the ones that are interesting, we subdivide them, and then we evaluate them again, and so on, in the three layers that I mentioned earlier. Because this is 3D, you have to think a little bit about the projection. Uh, and so we're doing the dumbest possible projection, which is completely orthographic. So every pixel in the output image is the highest voxel in its stack. And we can use Atomic's max, op max operations to make sure that the high highest voxel gets accumulated. So it looks something like this. Uh, in practice, we actually have a built-in 4x4 transform array. So you can transform your model before this dumb orthographic projection is applied, which lets us do things like this, where you can see there's perspective in this viewing. But this is an example of an output height map, where white pixels are closest to the camera, black right at the back. And it's not very legible to humans. We also want normals and shading. And it turns out there's a very cool trick where near the surface of the model, the partial derivatives of your equation are going to be approximately the normals of the model at that point. So we can borrow a technique from the machine learning folks over in the other track and use forward mode automatic differentiation, which is a way of evaluating the tape and tracking both the value and the partial derivatives. And so we're back to our tape. We have another flavor of interpreter where we have the value at a given point and then the partial derivatives with respect to x and y. Uh, we apply the chain rule to keep these updated as we go through all the different operations. And we end up with both the value and the direction that it's pointing, which is the normal in 3D. And this produces something like this model. Uh, so now you have this nice 3D shading, and you can do all of your standard tricks to it. Uh, I implemented screen space ambient occlusion, so you end up with this nice shading. But obviously, the sky's the limit once you have a depth and a normal map. We did this benchmarking on the same three machines, so relatively old laptop, uh, relatively new workstation, and biggest GPU I can get my hands on. And we evaluated three different models. The architecture model is very much a best case model. It's very CSG heavy. Uh, it's about 1,000 clauses. And this runs at 30 frames per second on the V100, even at 2048 voxels cubed, which is a relatively big voxel image. Uh, on older laptops, it performs obviously much worse. You need a modern GPU for this technique to work. We also revisit the gears model here. And so this is the 2D gears extruded and rotated a little bit. And this is a bit slower, so it's a bit less efficient, uh, where it's running at 30 frames per second at 1024 cubed, and then slower at higher resolutions. Finally, we have kind of the adversarial case for a model, which is a bear sculpt uh, based on a design by Hazel Fraticelli and Anthony Tacconi. And this is bad for the algorithm because it's very little CSG and it's a lot of smooth blends. So you're hit on two fronts. 
These uh, exponent and log operations might not have intervals that track as well, so that's one limitation. And also you have very little CSG, so you can't shorten the tape as effectively. So this is uh, beats 30 frames per second at 512 cubed, but then starts scaling down to 10 frames per second, 5 frames per second, and so on. Uh, so this is not suitable for real-time use, even on the big GPU. And we can revisit the same metric of amortized work per pixel for these 3D cases. And we see pretty much what we expect, where the architecture model is evaluating the model less than once per pixel. This is more impressive when you remember that each pixel is actually a stack of 1,000 voxels. So even with 1,000 voxels lined up here, it's evaluating it less than a third of a, it's walking the tape less than a third uh, for each pixel. The gears are a little bit less efficient, and then the bear is much less efficient, although it's still only evaluating the function a max of about 16 times per pixel here. And you can see there's sort of an interesting behavior where this is similar to sphere tracing. Around the edges of the model, you see it's doing more work because it can't quite prune those as efficiently. So there's an interesting correlation there. So now we're going to kind of wrap up and talk about conclusions and future work. Uh, so this has been a new method for rendering these mathematical implicit surfaces on the GPU without triangulation or ray tracing. It scales well with GPU power, comparing old laptops to modern data center GPUs. It works extremely well on hard surface CSG and more poorly on models that have fewer CSG operations. And then there are some limitations in terms of RAM access, which probably could be a subject for future work. There's a lot of interesting directions that you could take this. Uh, one strategy would be to use this technique to do a voxelization and then use another algorithm to do a high resolution rendering of that voxelization. And so that would let you do a relatively fast coarse voxelization, but then get big high resolution images. There's a lot of work that you can do to optimize the interval arithmetic. Um, reduced affine arithmetic is one branch of that. We could also optimize the depth culling. And finally, in my uh, desktop software that runs on the CPU side, we implement what we call oracles, which are kind of arbitrary black box functions. And this lets you plug in meshes or voxel data or other representations that aren't pure implicit uh, math expressions. So bringing this API over to the GPU uh, would kind of open up the space of what models you could represent and work with. We have a reference implementation. Uh, it's on my GitHub, github.com slash mpeter slash mpr. And one of the cool things about this is that you can reproduce the results in this paper for about $5 in compute time on AWS. Uh, and if you have problems doing that, then you should open up an issue and let me know. That about wraps it up. So I'd like to thank all of the beta readers. Uh, doing this as a solo author meant that the community I worked with was very important in this. Uh, Martin Galise let me use his big serve for, for benchmarking. I already mentioned Hazel and Anthony uh, helped me with the bear model. Uh, Peter derived the involute curve. My wife Jennifer did the architecture model. The anonymous reviewers were very helpful. In particular, the amortized work graph was based on one of their suggestions, and that turned out to be a really cool uh, way of visualizing the work. My colleagues at Formlabs, and then Entopology for supporting the, the Lib5 kernel that led to this work. That about wraps it up. So my name is Matt Keeter. I'm an independent graphics researcher. You can contact me online, on Twitter, on Gmail, uh, and I will probably respond. I hope you enjoyed this. Have a good one.